So what we've been doing basically over the past, over, over the entire uh, last lectures, well, okay, so may, maybe the very first few lectures was mostly me pointing out that there is this notion of reasoning that, that allows us to keep track of many possible hypotheses while data is accumulating over them, called probability theory. And one of the very first observations we made is that doing so can potentially be very, very, very expensive. Exponentially expensive in the number of variables and, well, in a way, linearly expensive in how many possible values the variables can take, which is still very bad if you think about continuous variables because they effectively take an infinite number of possible values. And then, ever since then, so this has been lecture three, four, five, and now six, has been all about showing you that it's nevertheless possible to do probabilistic reasoning, and in fact that it's not even particularly expensive to do. So there's this, um, sort of notion in the machine learning community that Bayesian inference probabilistic reasoning is somehow expensive and intractable and impossible and therefore we should just do deep learning and forget about probabilistic reasoning. This entire class is here to show you that that's not necessarily a good idea. Actually, it's just not a good idea because when we jettison probabilistic reasoning from machine learning, we're also losing all sorts of very interesting functionality that we will get to later in the class. So the way we've been doing this over the past few lectures is to look at a relatively broad structure of probability distributions called exponential families, which provide a very interesting algebraic structure with which we can, do, we can construct models. And I introduced it in this abstract form. So these, these are probability distributions over some variables x. We call those observations or the data, which are parameterized by some parameters w. So you can think of this as a conditional distribution, p of x given w, which have this algebraic structure that there is one term that depends only on the data. That's called the base measure. And a mixing term in the exponential between a function of the data called the sufficient statistics and the parameters, which you could also represent in some other way as canonical parameters. And then there's a normalization constant, which only depends on the value of the parameters. And I made the point several times that really what this boils down to is a language to describe models about data that sort of hinges on well, phi and z, where phi is something that you get to design. So phi, the sufficient statistics, is your model of how the data comes about, what you care about in the data. And z is the sort of price you have to pay because you need to be able to compute a normalization constant. So somehow, if you know this structure, if you decide to use this structure, you then have to be able to compute this thing. So this function is sort of defined through phi because it's the normalization constant of this. You have to be able to compute the integral over this function with respect to x, and then you're left with a function of w that is z of w up to inversion. But really, the point is that when, once you've done that, you're done. That's the entire modeling process. And everything afterwards follows procedurally from the rules of probability theory and just algebra. In particular, the prior that you should probably use for this kind of model to be able to do tractable inference on W kind of forces itself upon you in the form of a conjugate prior. So we encountered this notion of a conjugate prior, which is an algebraic structure such that the posterior, after observing some data drawn from this likelihood, has the same functional form as the prior. And we saw that every exponential family has a conjugate prior. This is this really busy slide. Let's look at it slowly again. Every exponential family of this form has a conjugate prior, which has this form, which is itself an exponential family, which has a base measure that we can construct to be just the uniform measure, the, the Lebesgue measure. Sufficient statistics, which consist of the natural parameters of the likelihood and the log partition function of the likelihood, which means that its natural parameters are some kind of pseudo counts of W and a counting variable that just keeps track of how many observations we've made so far. 
The only problem with this is that for this exponential family, we also need a log partition function, and in general, it can be intractable to compute this function. So the only real problem in doing Bayesian inference is that it's not that there has to be a prior. The prior is kind of forces itself upon you. The problem is that you need to know this function to do full Bayesian inference, because if you can, then the posterior is going to have this simple form to just evaluate basically a variant of this function where you just add to the natural parameters the sufficient statistics of the data and the count of the data and evaluate this function. And then you can do pretty much anything. You can evaluate the posterior, and you can predict future data mar by marginalizing over this um, conjugate prior, and you're, you're left with this predictive object which, by the way, will be your homework this week to implement part of your homework. So in a way, this is bad because it means you need to know f, but it also kind of really, really boils down what we need to know to be uncertain. We need to decide what our model is for the data, which in the exponential family case really reduces down to sufficient statistics, phi. There's one function you need to define. And then we need to be able to do, well, these two integrals, z, and f, and then we're done. And I said that usually you know z because you're picking your likelihood from a standard collection of exponential families. If it's a discrete random variable, you're probably going to use either the multinomial or the binomial distribution, and then the conjugate priors are a Dirichlet or a beta distribution. You might, if it's a real-valued variable, you might use a Gaussian likelihood. If it's a rate, then you might use a Poisson likelihood or a, um, with a conjugate prior called the gamma distribution. If it's some extreme event, you might use a Laplace likelihood and so on and so on. And then the main challenge is really basically left to do is F. And that's where we ended the last lecture because I ran out of time. So now I want to complete that story and say, well, actually, maybe we can get away approximately without actually computing F. And the first observation for this, I already kind of made, but I cleaned it up a little bit in the last lecture, which is that, of course, even if we don't know f, then we still know quite a lot about the shape, the geometry of this probability distribution. We know basically the entire thing up to a constant that scales the entire distribution. So in particular, we can reason about the shape of this distribution, the spread that it has. And we can use that to find, for example, the mode of this distribution. Not just the likelihood, that's what I did last week, but also the posterior. And it doesn't make any harder to construct the posterior. Why? Because let's look at this equation again. If this is our likelihood, exponential family, I've already left out h of x because it's not going to matter, because we're caring about the, the thing as a function of w. This is its conjugate prior, as we just saw. Then the posterior, as we saw, will be of the form something like this. So an exponential family with sufficient statistics given by the natural parameters of the likelihood and its log normalization constant with a minus in front. Um, sorry, natural parameters. No, 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 no. Sufficient statistics and natural parameters given by the updated sort of form. So the prior parameters plus the sum over the sufficient statistics of the likelihood and a counting variable for how many variables, how many observations we've seen. And then there's a normalization constant, but if you only need to know the, the mode, we don't need to know the normalization constant because, well, it just scales the distribution up and down, so it's not going to change where the mode is. In particular, we can find the mode by taking the logarithm of this expression because then the exponential goes away. That's nice. We are allowed to do that. Why? Yeah, well, because the logarithm is a monotonic transformation, yes. So if you're, if, you're trans, if you're transforming a function through a monotonic transformation, it doesn't change the location of the mode. Right? Because something that's further to the right than the others is going to be further to the up than the others. OK, uh, so we take the logarithm, and then we can compute the gradient of that logarithm, set it to 0. Well, and that's sort of, you can look at this and directly basically find for yourself that that means we have to solve this equation, which is neat because I already made this case on last Thursday. 
the right hand side doesn't, doesn't involve a W. So we're trying to solve for W, but the right hand side doesn't depend on W. And the right hand side is the thing that contains the data. So this is really, it's not really an optimization problem more than a root finding problem. There is a function of W that we need to optimize, and there's just a constant on the right that encapsulates the entire data. So in particular, this means if I give you a data set, or if that person who you're working with has given you a data set, and you've computed the sufficient statistics, you're not going to come back to the data afterwards. You can give it back. You can hand the USB key back with the data and finish your computation afterwards. The only time you would need the USB key back is if you decide to change your model, change the likelihood. So change the sufficient statistics, fine. And the other nice thing about this is it's actually posterior inference. So here what I've done is I've just allowed the prior to enter through its, sufficient st through its um, natural parameters here. And the only thing that has changed is that we have an extra little alpha up here and an extra little nu. So you can think of those as regularizers from a statistical perspective or as this little epsilon, right, that makes sure that we're not accidentally dividing by zero. It's, you can also just say it's well, it's just well written code to do, it, to do it this way because it ensures that your algorithm is always going to one. So even if you have no data yet, you can still make predictions, right? You can ask the algorithm from the start. If you set new to whatever, one or 0.5, and alpha to whatever else, right? 0.5 or 1 or whatever you like. Or maybe even 0, alpha isn't that important. OK, um, so after that, so with this we can find the mode. So that means there is our, there's our function. Of, I'm going to draw it with my hands rather than on the, on the blackboard, which um, now will have a mode which we can find. And if we were statisticians, we'd stop there and say, ah, here's our estimate, right? Maximum a posteriori, or maximum regularized likelihood, or whatever you might want to call this. But we would like to be uncertain. And we're nearly there, where we already have an estimate. We have a full prior and likelihood. We know what the shape is. We have the entire thing. The only thing missing is this normalization constant. So, how would we address this with our current approach? Yeah. Uh, OK, so these were several questions wrapped into one. It, so the question is, is if, for everyone else, is um, if, I can, if I can try to paraphrase, is if, you have, if you're in a sequential setting, so I made this point about the person with the USB key has entered the room and left the room again, and your data is sort of now encapsulated in the sufficient statistics, what happens if you get more data in the future? Well, so if you get more data, then you just add more terms in this sum over there. So your question is about this phi, right? Might, maybe I might decide to change phi later. Yeah, so maybe there are settings where as you get more data, you actually convince yourself that the sufficient statistics you used were the wrong ones. And we'll get to that, not today, but in eh, not so many lectures from now. But a standard setting, and actually one that gets you quite far, as you will see in the next few lectures, is you've decided what phi is, what, what about your data you care about, but what you don't know yet are those parameters. So for example, you, you've decided you want to know what the probability is for someone to wear glasses, you just don't know yet what the probability is, but you can keep getting more and more people. So if you do that, all you have to do is just update this count here. And of course, that's going to shift where the mode is, so it's going to shift our point estimate. And if you're really in that sequential setting, you might want to think about how you do this update efficiently. Now, for our very simple case cases with the beta distribution, it's, you don't need to worry about it because I've, I've shown you that you can do, even do it in a silly web app. 
So it's so, so simple that it's, it's really straightforward, right? But of course, you might have something a little bit more challenging on your hands, and then you have to think a bit more about how to do this. OK, so the point, though, is, well, maybe your question also was about, so what about like, there will be an error in this model, and why shouldn't we not just better keep this point estimate? My main message is, again, no matter whether you believe in your model or not, it's always a good idea to track uncertainty. If you don't believe in your model, then, of course, you also don't believe in your uncertainty. And you have to think about what you can do to track this uncertainty about your model as well. We'll get to that. But it's never the right idea to say, ah, there's going to be something wrong about it. So just, just not do uncertainty at all, because it's going to be wrong. This is a classic rhetorical trick from the frequentist side to just say, well, your assumptions are going to be wrong. So it's better to just make an estimate and not talk about the errors. That's just shifting the problem to someone else, the person who has to work with the output of your model. Right? And then it's easy. Sometimes you're in, in this lucky situation professionally that someone can come back and say, well, your prediction was wrong. You say, oh, well, whatever. I, did, I never claimed that it was right. right. Well, so what was the error? Well, I wouldn't know. I can't possibly quantify the error. Right? It's easy as a rhetorical trick, but it doesn't get you anywhere. So of course, sometimes it takes an investment to sort of say, here is a first idea of what the error might be. And then it's, it's sometimes more difficult rhetorically to explain to the person you're talking to that that doesn't, doesn't capture every possible error. But it still tells you something about your model. Just like when you write unit tests, it's usually a good idea to write unit tests, right? Now, well, your test suite is not going to cover your entire code base. So actually, I mean, there are some people who try to get like 100% coverage on their GitHub repo, but typically it's more like 80, 60, whatever percent, right? And then people are quite happy about that already. That doesn't mean that it's a bad idea to write unit tests, and you shouldn't write unit tests. You should still try to cover as much as you can. You want to find out what's wrong. You want to sort of diagnose your, your code. And uncertainty is a way to diagnose your model, to ask it, how much have you actually learned from the data yet? How much data do I have? Even if it doesn't capture all of the possible ways in which it could go wrong. So how do we get away from maximum, well, likelihood, or as I just showed you, maximum a posteriori, actually, which is Really not much of a difference, because yet again, my point, the prior doesn't really matter so much. Right? The difference between maximum likelihood and a posteriori is just whether we add these two numbers there, alpha and nu, whatever. Right? So actually, funnily enough, the grand master of, uh, of probability theory already basically told us how to do it in 1810 or so. So I, made, I showed you this very quickly in passing when we went through it in the, in the lecture number three or so, um, thinking about how many people are wearing glasses, right? But that has had this problem that in his particular exponential family, which we now realize is an exponential family, this binomial distribution, there is this normalization constant which he didn't know, the beta function. Well, I mean, he knew what it was, but he couldn't compute it because it was a difficult integral. So um, he also already made this trick that we are now just going through. He, for his particular exponential family, he found the mode by taking the logarithm of this expression. That means this annoying factor becomes a constant at the end. Then we can con con take the gradient of this function with respect to x, find that gradient, set it to 0, find the mode, which in this case happens to be at this particular value, and then compute a second derivative of this function at the mode find that it has a particular form. It looks like this. It's a bit of an annoying expression, but it just involves numbers. So you can actually compute it. And it's the kind of function that Laplace, even in 18 or something, could just compute, in particular if those a and b's are integers. And what that tells us is the curvature of the problem at the mode. And Laplace observed, without thinking yet about normal distributions and Gaussians or whatsoever, he just knew that Gauss had already solved the corresponding integral, which allowed him to make a closed form expression, which is, if we, comp if we find the mode, then we can, at the mode, express the log probability distribution as a quadratic term. Right? So the Taylor expansion is a constant term, the value of the function at the mode, plus a linear term, which involves the gradient, and because we're at the mode, the gradient is 0, so that term is 0, plus a quadratic term around the mode. 
And that quadratic term is 1 half times the square distance to the mode times this object, which is the second derivative at the mode. And it's just this annoying expression, so I've given it a name and called it psi. I'm going to use psi throughout the entire lecture for this thing. And it's soon going to become a matrix, but for Laplace, it was just a number. That means the log probability distribution is a, a, the exp, is, is a quadratic. The probability distribution is the exponential of a square. And Gauss had figured out how to compute integrals over exponentials of squares. Actually, of negative squares, so there has to be a minus here, but whatever, right? We can just redefine psi or basically move a minus here, shift minuses around, and then everything works out. And we're left with an expression for which we know the value. It has something to do with square root of pi and the square root of this times the thing that we don't know the normalization constant of, evaluated at the mode. So that's a function that we can evaluate up to the fact that we don't know the normalization constant. But we know that this is supposed to be a probability distribution, so it integrates to 1. And now we are left with an equation where there's only one unknown variable, the normalization constant. And we're done. So this particular idea, Laplace did for his distribution. But now, in 2013, we can think about this in code for the general case of our exponential family. So let's go lift this back up to this abstract representation that we had. The exponential family is of this form. It has a conjugate prior of this form. So whether we have data or not, we are always going to deal with a distribution that has this form. So I'm going to write it as a distribution over w with a bunch of parameters, which I'll call alpha prime and nu prime. And maybe to make this very clear at this point, it, it really doesn't matter what alpha prime and nu prime are. You could get those from just a prior, not having seen any data yet. Then you can predict data. You can get them after a bunch of data by including terms like this, sufficient statistics of the data. And then you can predict the future data, more data beyond the ones that you've seen. You could also look back and try to predict the data you've seen that somehow feels a bit dangerous, right? You're probably going to become overconfident or whatever. It's like testing on the train set or whatever. But you can still do it. It's a function you can call. You just have to be careful what you claim about it, right? Um, and you could also just basically call this a function that you can evaluate at any possible value of alpha prime nu prime, right? The main point is that's the algebraic form it's going to have. We know that it looks like this. Now we're going to do what Laplace did, but abstractly. We'll take the, lo we'll take the logarithm of this expression. So that means the normalization constant literally becomes a constant, which makes it easy to think about the mode. We'll take the gradient of this expression with respect to w. That turns into a root finding problem, as we just saw. Here it is written again. And we find the mode. So how do we find the mode? We could find it on a piece of paper, like Laplace did. Or we could call an optimizer these days. The optimizer is like the pedestrian solution. It's the, the thing you do if you don't know what else to do, like just hope that SciPy does it for you. It's a bit dangerous, because it's going to do something and give some answer. Um, and you'll not really know whether it worked or not. It's just like deep learning, right? You could, call, you could call Adam as well, of course. It's not like anyone, it's not like it's forbidden to use Adam. There are better optimizers if you know the data, but whatever, right? And it's just going to do something, and you'll have to deal with whatever learning rates and decay and shit, but whatever. OK, so you'll get an estimate. OK? Um, but you can also sometimes do it on a piece of paper, because everything is, is sort of relatively well understood. And if you can solve it on a piece of paper, of course, that's going to save you a lot of time in the code. It's going to run way faster. So yeah, well, if it's a homework exercise, maybe the numerical solution is easier, because you don't have to deal with it afterwards. If it's a product you're building, well, better make sure you make it as fast as you can. OK, once we found the mode, we can think of our, I keep wanting to call it loss function, but let's just call it a log posterior probability distribution as a function for which we can do a Taylor expansion that will contain a constant at the mode, 
a linear expression, which I've now written out explicitly, if we are actually at the mode, then this is just zero. And then a quadratic term, which I've now written sort of in full algebraic glory, because it might well be a matrix, this, this second derivative, right? If you have more than one parameter w, and our exponential families usually always have more than one parameter, then the second derivative span a matrix, right? Where the ijth element is the derivative of this function with respect to first the ith element of w and then the jth element of w. And what's that matrix called? The Hessian, yes, yeah. Ah, so your question is, what happens if the mode is at the edge of the parameter, of the parameter space? Then things are a bit hairy. And we need to think about what we do with it. So let me draw a picture, though, more generally. So just so that I keep, keep everyone in sort of give an idea of what's going on. So here's this distribution for which we don't know the normalization constant. We've taken its logarithm. That means it looks like this in the log space. We found the mode. And then we did a quadratic expansion. So typically, this will look something like this. So now the exponential of this function looks like a Gaussian probability distribution, because it's e to the minus some quadratic form. Now, if you're somewhere in a corner, if this function looks like, like, like this, where this is your parameter domain, uh, that's not a good situation to be in. Right? Then we have to be a bit more careful about what we do. There are also many other ways in which this co could go wrong. Right? Maybe this log probability distribution looks like, uh, actually, the distribution might look like this. Right? Then we're going to find a function, a distribution that looks like this, which is going to miss most of the, of the uncertainty. So it's not like we can just stop thinking when we do this. But you can also imagine that maybe these are pathological cases. Right? And quite often, you'll get away with just doing this. And more importantly, all of these situations are better than just pointing, just returning the mode and then claiming that you're not responsible for it. That's my most important point, right? If someone just comes like, oh, it's just a point estimate, whatever, I'm not allowed to talk about the error, right? That it's still better to say, oh, right, I'm actually at the corner. That seems really dangerous. Or, oh, the, the, actually, the curvature at this mode is not positive or actually not negative for the mode, right? So, uh, this, which means this Hessian is not ne negative definite, then that seems like I might be in a, in a sort of a nasty situation like this, even if it's not at the corner, and so on and so on. And then I can think about it and see what I can do. Yes, well, OK. Well, so. When we talk about deep learning, this, these will become loss functions. Hmm? So x is the data, w is the weights of your whatever network is going to be. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how, how close to the mode do we have to be for the Laplace approximation to be a good, approx to be a good approximation to the posterior? So this, this, the story is sort of, right, as, you, as you move away from the mode, they become, they, we get more and more of a deviation between this quadratic approximation and the true log probability distribution. And well, so the mathematical answer is, that's the O of cubed term in the Taylor expansion. And that is one way to think about this. You could say, you know, maybe I should, maybe I should compute a, a third derivative 
without like, go, going too far away into some direction that everyone else shouldn't get confused about right now, the object you would need to compute is a tensor of third order. And if w is a long vector, this object will become very large. It will become cubically large in w. And that's then usually too much. So if you think of a deep neural network, it's not going to happen. So there are other tricks that people do in practice, but it's too early in the lecture now to think about them. But just to give you one simple quick answer, is this is a Gaussian distribution that we're approximating with. You could draw from this Gaussian distribution random wa with the values for, for w. And then the Gaussian tells you what the PDF should be at that case, if it's the correct one. And you just evaluate the PDF at that point and check how far it deviates from the Gaussian. And then that gives, can give you a stochastic estimate for how wrong you are. OK. So if, for example, in this case, right, you would draw points over here, which happen very rarely. And then you will notice, ooh, actually, the model would say, this is still very likely. That's not good. I'll need to do something about this. OK, so let's finish this thought, though. So we, um, we've done our quadratic approximation. The exponential of a quadratic is something that Gauss knows how to compute the integral over. By the way, this, this lecture is called Gaussian distributions. So in the second half after the break, we'll talk about Gaussian distributions. If you're confused by these, just wait for 15 minutes. We'll get there. And we know how to compute the normalization constant of this. The normalization constant of a Gaussian distribution is this term here. It's the square root of 2 pi, to the dimensionality of the problem. That's the number of w's we care about, times the determinant of this negative inverse Hessian distribution. So the determinant of the inverse is the inverse of the determinant. It's not so bad, right? You can compute the determinant. If you compute the determinant, you can also compute the determinant of the inverse. Um, it's just an inverse in here by, because of the definition, right, of how Gaussians are typically defined. And we now know that the problem behind this is just, you know, exponential families, that the way we think about Gaussians is in terms of their canonical parameters rather than natural parameters. So we could write our probability distribution as the value of the, the actual correct posterior at the mode. So this is a function we know completely up to its normalization constant times a Gaussian probability distribution, normalized, standardized, with mean at the mode and covariance given by the negative inverse Hessian of the log PDF at the mode times this annoying number, whatever it is. We have to compute it, but it's just a number. And that means we know every, everything up to this normalization constant, and now we can fix it because we know that this has to be a probability distribution. So I've con I continue the argument. The first line is the same as in the last slide. We know that this object has to be a probability distribution, so it has to integrate to 1. So if we integrate over w, there is only one w in here. And this is a probability distribution, so it integrates to 1. Everything else is just w hat, and w hat is a particular number. It's not a variable. So this has to be 1. The integral over this is 1. So we just know that 1 has to be roughly equal to this function, which contains an unknown constant, times this whatever thing, square root of 2 pi, blah, 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 blah. And we know that this is, we, now we plug in the value for the, value, the p of w hat, um, which looks like this. I've just plugged in this algebraic form again. And the only thing we don't know about this is this normalization constant. So now we know that our normalization constant can be written like this. It's a function of alpha, new, uh, alpha prime and nu prime, which depends in a complicated nonlinear fashion, actually, on where we find the mode. But locally, we can think of it as a simple function of alpha prime and nu prime, which only enter at three points here and there, and actually in this Hessian. OK? So let's add this to our um, piece of uh, code. So here is our, can you read this? Is it too small in the back? It's OK? Good. So this is our abstract base class, again, for exponential families. You've seen it last lecture. Um, 
we defined it with all of these like basic things that define the exponential family. And then we realized that when you define these basic objects, the sufficient statistics, the base measure, and the log partition function, that actually also engenders a conjugate prior, which we have constructed down here as an exponential family itself, which has sufficient statistics, which arise from the likelihood, and it has a base measure, which is just a natural base measure, the Lebesgue measure, and it has a log partition function, which in general we don't know. So we need to ask the likelihood, do you know, do you happen to know what the log partition function is? And then in general, the likelihood is going to answer, I don't know, not implemented error. But if it does, then it can return it, and then we can do full Bayesian inference. Like, for example, for the binomial, we know that the beta function is the conjugate um, log partition function. But if we don't know, then we can now do something cool. We can add to our conjugate family the ability to sort of simulate its normalization constant by adding a function at the bottom here that's called Laplace precision, which says, OK, if you don't know what my log, number, log partition function is, then just tell me where my mode is, either because you know on paper or because an optimizer has told you where the mode is. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to evaluate my negative Hessian at the mode. And that's a function of the natural parameters of this object, right? Of alpha and nu. And then I can return this. This is called the precision because it's the inverse of the covariance matrix of this Gaussian. Yeah? Ah, so the question is, what's the relationship to the inverse Fisher information matrix? They are very close. And I don't want to go too far away from them. But there is a big theory in frequentist statistics about the asymptotic error of a maximum likelihood estimate. And it's very, very closely related to this, up to some normalization, up to some 1 over n, whatever thing. OK. Um, so, uh, yeah. And so we can do that because we can evaluate the unnormalized log PDF of the posterior because its form is algebraically forced upon us by the sufficient statistics of the likelihood. So let's do one example of this, and then I'll go into the break very briefly. Um, so here's a quick summary, but actually, OK, I'll briefly summarize, and I'll do the example. So exponential families provide an algebraic structure in which you can do Bayesian inference by writing down a modeling assumption, sufficient statistics. Basically, everything else becomes predetermined. There's a corresponding normalization constant called Z. There's a corresponding conjugate prior, which has a, its own normalization constant called F. And in general, you can't evaluate F, but you can do Bayesian inference up to normalization. And if you don't know the normalization constant, one out of actually several possible options, but a very, very efficient one, is to find the mode, evaluate the Hessian at the mode, and we can do this using autodiff. So this is a, it's also a notion that historically kind of got lost out of favor because people hated computing Hessians. It was just too much work. But it's 2023, and we have JAX and PyTorch and whatever, all these automatic differentiation libraries. So they do the Hessian for us. And that directly gives us an approximation to the normalization constant. So what can we do with that? Well, here's a tongue-in-cheek, not entirely serious example. So you've noticed that these distributions are very Im somehow important, right? In classic statistics, they are associated with the names of these big old white dudes, right? So Gauss, the Gaussian distribution, the beta distribution, which is associated with Laplace, uh, the gamma distribution, which comes from Euler, the Dirichlet distribution, there he is at the top right, and um, the gamma distribution also has something to do with Bernoulli because he wrote it down. And there are all these other people, you know, like, um, uh, well, here's Boltzmann, for example, who used them in uh, thermodynamics. What if, you know, it, it, wouldn't it be kind of cool to add yourself to this, right? Wouldn't you have your own name, like on Wikipedia? Wouldn't that be nice somewhere, like be up there, have your own picture? extend the list a bit. Well, you can do that. What do you have to do? 
you have to find one integral called z. That's it. So after this lecture, you can go across the street into the main library of the university, find one of these really big books that list integrals, the Gratstein and whatever, right, these big blue like, paperweights, go through it, find some fun integral that no one has used yet, and attach your name to it. And that's what I've done here. So I've looked up a particular weird integral, which I found actually in one of these books. Here it is. I've observed that this integral is known. So the integral from 0 to infinity over um, the exponential of minus um, first parameter times x squared minus second parameter over x squared, so that's x to the minus 2, is given by the square root of pi over w1 times e to the minus 2 square root of w1, w2. It's just in this table of integrals. Uh, so if you want to do the integral from minus infinity to plus infinity, it's just multiplied by 2. Huh? OK? Um, so you, that amounts to basically an exponential family with sufficient statistics given by these two functions, x squared and x minus squared, x inverse squared. So now what's left to do is just to write a big, cool paper right, about, with a nice story about how this is a really important distribution. So maybe, let's say, I don't know, something with physics, because there's going to be, so in this picture, I've plotted in, in thin black in the background um, these two features. So this is the quadratic function, e to the square. Actually, no, it's just square. And this is the um, 1 over square function. So maybe we can think of some orbitals of some atoms, right, where there's two forces, one attracting that drops with, this, that, right, with the square, and one repulsing that drops with 1 over the square. I don't know, electro, weak interaction, whatever, right? And we're going to find some solution where the stuff is sort of at some constant distance to the, to the nucleus. But we don't know what the parameters are, so maybe the parameters have something to do with how many protons there are in the nucleus and how many neutrons or whatever, right? So we just give names to them. We call them W1, W2, and that's it. Given this, here's our probability distribution. And now we just have to use a big curly character for it so that it looks like a big important thing, right? And of course, I'm going to use an H because I want this to sort of sneaky get into Wikipedia with my name, right? So, OK, so here we go. Now we can do Bayesian inference on W. What, what do we need to do to implement this? We define this distribution. Here it is up there. Actually, I've cleaned up a little bit the notation. I've introduced new parameters, theta. I call them the canonical parameters. They are actually just the square, uh, the square root of the weights. Why? Because if you look at this expression, you notice there's a lot of square roots floating around. Doesn't look good. So I just use theta which is the square root of w1 or w2, and then everything looks a bit neater, and this is the distribution. Here's the normalization constant. Here is the linear term. And what I have to do to implement this is just this cell. It's called it the bagel distribution because it has this toroidal, toroidal shape right around the center. Um, it's an exponential family. It has sufficient statistics, which are given by minus x squared and x minus squared. That's the business end. And it has a, normal, it has a base measure, which is just the Lebesgue measure, just one. Um, it has these natural and canonical parameters w and theta, which we can map to and from by taking square roots or squaring. And the only real thing, the only actual contribution that makes this a beautiful new probability distribution is that I found somewhere in a book that this is the log, this is the log partition function. So the log normalization constant of this is just this expression up here. So it's one, the logarithm of it is one half. Oh, there's a, oh, the square root didn't get rendered. There's a square root missing here. OK. Weird markdown error. OK. So it's the square root of pi minus the logarithm of, t of the first 
entry in theta, zero base counting, minus the product over the thetas, theta one, theta two, times two. Done. That's it. And now we can do everything with it. Everything is directly inherited. We could, for example, plot the distribution in x. It's also a likelihood in w. It has a conjugate prior. I don't even know, like I haven't even written it down. It's not on the slides. But I don't need to, because the abstract base class will know. It will generate its conjugate prior with the corresponding sufficient statistics and natural parameters, and it'll know how to construct the log uh, unnormalized probability density function for this prior. Actually, I can plot it. So I've done this here. I've, this, this prior will have two natural parameters, actually three, alpha one and alpha two, because there's w1, w2, or theta one, theta two. And it just has two alphas. I, I don't know, I've set them to minus one half, whatever. And it has a counting variable, new, which in this case I've set to zero, but you could set it to something else. That's, those are the prior parameters for this prior, which I get by just telling my likelihood, please construct whatever the conjugate prior is, take care of it. And then I give some data, which I've just invented. Let's say I've made four measurements that look like this. Um, then I can construct a posterior, which will be of the same form as the prior, because it's a conjugate prior, and it has natural parameters, which I can just ask the thing to construct for me by adding in the data. So what will it do internally? It'll take the data, computer sufficient statistics, add them to the prior parameters, and that's it. And then we can plot this. So the sh this color shading in the background, that is the log posterior of this distribution up to normalization. So it's not normalized yet. But if I want to normalize it, what I, the only thing I need to do is to find the mode at this point, compute the Hessian, and it'll give me this, like, spoiler alert, this Gaussian approximation that you see as two red ellipses. So how have I found those? Well, I could just call an optimizer. And actually, the code for this is here, and it's just commented out. This is what I had initially thought we could do. So we just load an optimizer and then just tell the optimizer, well, take the unnormalized log PDF and find whatever the mode might be. But actually, maybe let's wait a second and see if we can do it ourselves. So if you go a little bit, so here's the reparameterization. A parameter is like, whoops, sorry, like this with theta. And now, so I don't want to, to annoy you too much with this, but it turns out you can actually find the mode yourself. So if you take the log normalized, the, 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 uh, the log PDF, sorry, the log normalization constant, log Z, from the previous slide, and you don't have to do this now, follow this argument mentally yourself, but I just take the function from the previous side, slide, take the logarithm, compute the gradient, which you can do on a piece of paper yourself, then you get stuck twice, which is why last Thursday I couldn't do this yet for you. There was a bug in the derivation, so I had to go back, spend another hour last evening getting it right. That is the sort of thing, the price you have to pay for doing it by hand. And then you find a mode, you basically have to compute a bunch of things, so they are more or less the sufficient statistics up to normalization, so you just rewrite them as something like this, and then we can construct the estimates, theta one and theta two in closed form from those. There are just some Sorry, some transformations. So if we do that, then we get, we actually do this here. So that's this piece of annoying code. So, you know, I construct this mu bar and omega bar that is on the slide, and then do some simple rearrangements to find the mode. Then we can ask, that's the cool thing. Here's the, like, the point ask the posterior to evaluate its curvature at that mode, that's this line, and it'll do it for us because it's 2023 and it can compute Hessians. Like in 19, actually in 2007, this would not have been possible. In 2011, it would still have been like an arcane art. But in 2023, you know, we have checks, and it just does it. And it immediately 
gives us, so this is just a bit of plotting annoyance, this approximation. And now we have an almost perfect posterior over those parameters of this function that I just came up with by looking at a text. So if you encounter some data that really has this weird sufficient statistics or you decide that that's the thing you care about, then you can define your own probability distribution. And this abstract base class will take care of all of the algebra for you up to full Bayesian inference. So really, Bayesian inference isn't that hard. You just define your model. That's what you do in other languages for machine learning as well. And then afterwards, we just keep track of geometry. We find modes and then shapes around the mode. And this finding the shape, this used to be something historically that sort of people forgot about. Because when people like me wrote their PhD, fi finding that curvature estimate was really tedious. Like it was, I, like at around the time I submitted my PhD thesis, I would have said, ah, oh, this is stupid, I'm not gonna do that. Because if you have more than five parameters, it's a 25 entries in the matrix, right? Five by five. I'm not going to sit down and compute all of those and that's gonna be a bug in there and I'm not gonna get it right and whatever, right? It's not gonna, but these days with Autodiff, this thing has sort of received some rejuvenation. This wouldn't have been a topic in a lecture 10 years ago, but now, in my opinion, it's the way we should, going forward, think about probabilistic reasoning. Not as the correct and final and ultimate answer, but to understand why inference isn't actually so hard. You just need to find the curvature of this, yeah, I keep doing like this because I'm thinking of the negative log PDF, right, around the mode, and it gives you a Gaussian approximation and everything is done. Okay, with that, let's take a quick break. Five minutes, quarter past 11, I'll continue. I want to now finally get to the point that was actually supposed to be the core of this to today's lecture, but it's become sort of a, 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 maybe an afterthought that we'll spend so much time on over the next five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 12 lectures that it maybe doesn't matter so much, which is um, maybe, maybe the best way to think about this is this, this question that was asked by one of you last week in the feedback, where I said, if at the end, we're going to do Laplace approximations for everything, why are we even doing all this business with these annoying exponential families in the first place? Aren't you just going to eventually talk about Gaussian distributions anyway? And the answer is sort of yes. Um, there's this beautiful structure that I wanted to talk about and then we'll focus for the majority of this class on Gaussian distributions. And we'll get to talk a lot about why I do that, so I'm not going to do it now. But maybe the question is why? Why should we actually care about this Gaussian? I keep pointing out, so I made it sort of simple for myself because I was pretty sure that everyone in this room, maybe I should check who knows what the Gaussian distribution is or who has encountered the Gaussian distribution before. Here's the one chance where everyone can, ah. Who knows the normal distribution? Just check, check whether everyone is awake or not. Not everyone's hands are up. Okay, so I'm not trying to make fun of those who didn't raise their hands, but you've all heard of this bell curve. If you've had some ever so basic statistics class, you've heard about this man. There he is, where's the pointer? There, and actually the painting is the other way around. It's a mirrored painting because otherwise it wouldn't have fit on the money. Um, and this distribution, which you cannot read so well in the back, but here it is, and in the background, there's the city where he did most of his work, Göttingen. Um, this is what the money looked like when I went to high school. Um, and this distribution, this bell-shaped distribution, this normal distribution, which has this algebraic form that's actually on the money. F of x is one over square root of two pi times sigma squared times e to the minus x minus mu squared over two sigma squared, that somehow seems to be really important. Here it is properly. Um, so important, in fact, that I've reduced 
pretty much all exponential families to this, to this distribution. Here it is, again, it's this bell curve, which is often parameterized by these so-called canonical parameters, mu and sigma squared, which are, as it happens, the mean of this distribution. So the mean is an algebraic property, right, or an analytic property. It's the integral over the linear function times that distribution, the expected value of the linear function, the first moment is the mean, and sigma is the second central moment. Actually, sigma squared is the second central moment, the variance of x, and without the square, we talk of the standard deviation. Okay, so this is the boring bit um, for most of you. And you've heard that apparently IQs are distributed like this, and heights, and whatever, and everything else. Why is this distribution so important? Does anyone want to give an answer? There's many possible answers, of course. The central limit theorem, that's the typical answer that usually comes after. There's this fundamental, the central statement of stochastics, right? Or I don't know, maybe, yeah, maybe stochastics is the right term for it, which says, as every, hey, by the way, hands up. Who, uh, so who has heard of the central limit theorem? I'm not gonna ask you to, okay. Who could recite it if I asked to? Yeah, okay, so, this, uh -huh. so the theorem says something like the sum of IID random variables is asymptotically distributed like this. And there are variants of it that even work without IID but have some other requirements. So this is a good motivation for it, but actually it's a bit post hoc. So um, the reason we care about Gaussian distributions is that they have wonderful analytic properties. And the central limit theorem is a little bit like Taylor's theorem that says that any function that's sufficiently regular can be locally approximated by a linear function. And well, other order, higher order terms. And it would be weird to say linear functions, linear algebra is important because of Taylor's theorem. Right? It's the other way around. Taylor's theorem is useful because linear algebra is so super cool. You can do so many things, interesting things with linear algebra, and especially with computers and linear algebra. And therefore, it's very useful that most functions can be locally approximated by a linear function. Similarly, Gaussians have wonderful properties because they actually are just linear algebra. They reduce probability theory, as we're going to see in a moment, onto linear algebra. And because linear algebra is so fundamental, the central limit theorem helps us because it allows us to talk about most distributions in terms of Gaussians. It provides a theoretical motivation, a kind of rhetorical argument to say, I'm allowed to talk about Gaussians because after lots and lots of data, locally, things will look a little bit like a Gaussian. And in fact, what I did here with Laplace is pretty much that argument. I just said, it's okay to do, find the mode and do a quadratic approximation around the mode that means we are missing all the third and fourth and fifth and higher order terms, but it's gonna be good enough because once you have lots of data, the distribution will be relatively narrow, and that's what the central limit theorem then says. So what are those good, these wonderful uh, algebraic or analytic properties of the Gaussian distribution? Let's talk about them a little bit. So first of all, we already saw that these, this distribution up here, that it's actually an exponential family. It's just an exponential family with natural parameters that look a little bit different than the ones we usually encounter. Um, the natural parameters of this exponential, the, actually, let's first talk about the sufficient statistics because they are the defining quantities of exponential families. The sufficient statistics are, depending on how you want to define them, either the mean, so the first moment of the data, the sum over x, or, uh, sorry, and the second non-central moment, so sum over x squared, or depending on how you want to deal with the base measure, we can also introduce a constant. So it's like the zero first and second moment of the data define the sufficient statistics. Sometimes it can be more convenient to define them with a minus, um, doesn't really change much. And the sufficient uh, the natural parameters are one over the variance called the precision, the inverse variance, and that precision, the inverse variance, multiplied with the mean. 
which is sometimes somewhat awkwardly called the precision-adjusted mean. But we've talked so long about exponential families that I don't want to annoy you further with that. But of course, it means this fact that they are exponential families that we can do very efficient inference from data with Gaussians. And here I'm not going to bore you with this because you now know if I have a Gaussian prior, which is this curve, and single observations that are Gaussian distributed, so that means there is a likelihood that looks like this, then the posterior will also be a Gaussian, which is like inferring the mean of a Gaussian with known variance. And we've done that. And that's this red curve. And all across science, it has become commonplace to not actually draw this entire likelihood, but just draw something like this, a circle with an arrow bar. And whenever someone draws a circle with an arrow bar, they mean that there is this distribution underneath. At, unless they really go into a long spiel explaining why it isn't. And if you have lots and lots of data, then we can keep doing that. If you have lots and lots of likelihood terms like this, even with varying variances, we can just add them in. And adding in literally means adding them in to the sufficient statistics. So we update the precision by starting with a there it is. By starting with a prior precision and then summing up the precisions of all the individual observations. And we add, sum up the precision-adjusted mean by starting with the precision-adjusted mean of the prior and adding up all the precision-adjusted means of the data, which involve the actual observations of the data. We've saw, seen this example already. And this was really the original reason why Gauss cared about this. He wrote about this in, um, and by the way, in a moment, I'm going to have to eat my words. Here's, by the way, the original painting. As you can see, it's not mirrored. Um, and on the money, it was just flipped around. Uh, Gauss was interested in the paths of the planets around the sun. So this was after the Co Copernican revolution. People had accepted that the planets are revolving around the sun, but he needed very precise measurements of those orbits for various scientific reasons. And so he kept measuring them, and he realized that when every time you measure, you make a mistake. So how do you keep track of those mistakes that happen at different points in time across the trajectory? You measure you measure Saturn here, and then there, and then there on the sky. Somehow, there should be a way to keep track of this. And he wrote this um, amazing text called, uh, in, in Latin, something about the paths of the celestial bodies that are revolve around the sun on cone intersections, because that's what ellipses are, uh, intersections of cones. And he noticed that what you can do is you can add up the, the, the squares of the arrows, and, and that will lead to an equation that you can solve in closed form. And now I have to eat my words, because actually it turned out that Gauss wasn't the inventor of that normalization constant. If you read the original text here, sorry, it's not the original. It's the translated German text, because the Latin one, I guess no one here in the room could probably read. He actually says, uh, da, 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 da. Here's this distribution, which involves e to the one half times a constant times delta delta, so square of delta, times an unknown normalization constant. Ferner sieht man leicht ein, dass k notwendig negativ sein müsse. So k has to be a negative number, otherwise it doesn't normalize. Blah 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 blah. So that omega can even have a maximum, so dass in der Tat ein größtes werden könne. Weshalb wir sehen das, which was why we see that we have to set it to something, something. And then vermittelt des Eleganten zuerst von Laplace gefundenen Theorems. So thanks to Laplace who actually found out that this integral is square root of pi. Ah, so Gauss shifts the, the wonderful uh, result back to Laplace. Uh, we can write our distribution like this. H over the square root of pi times e to the minus h h delta delta. He couldn't write a square yet because that notation didn't exist yet. So he realized that after that, you can now do a computation that is closed form. And that's really beautiful because he comes up with an algorithm for solving such systems of linear equations in this text. 
which these days is called Gaussian elimination. It's maybe the very first computer algorithm ever invented because he writes it in the form of a mechanism of an algorithm rather than a long-winded argument about how he finds some numbers for maybe the very first time, at least in Western literature. So these days, of course, we think of this with hindsight, with all of this notation for linear algebra that has been invented over the last 200 years in a much more compact form. We have learned how to write these things such that they are easy for our eyes to parse. And that's thanks to the hard work of people over generations who have fiddled with this notation to make it ever more convenient. And that still keeps going on to this day as we think about them in terms of arrays now, which have multidimensional inputs and can be combined and consumed in various ways. So this distribution has a multivariate form. It can be generalized to the multivariate case like this, which Again, just to double check, raise your hand if you've seen an expression like this before. Good, thank you. So it's a normalization constant, which involves 2 pi raised to the number of, the, of dimensions of the problem, a half, times the determinant of the covariance matrix sigma. Maybe we need to talk about the determinant at some point. Times the exponential of a quadratic form. And the fact that it's a quadratic form, that's the thing that makes it really work. Because quadratic functions are wonderful. The main thing for this to work is, as Gauss actually points out, k has to be notwendig negative. These days, we say that sigma has to be a positive definite matrix. And I sometimes ask people in job interviews, what's a positive definite matrix? And then maybe you can think for yourself whether you still remember your undergraduate linear algebra class where you've learned about positive definite matrices. It's one, the standard textbook definition of positive definite is this. So a matrix is called symmetric positive semi-definite. And we're going to constantly flip definite and semi-definite back and forth because it doesn't actually matter. It's just a case of keeping track of zeros correctly um, in the code. If for any vector v that you can throw at this matrix from the left and the right, the resulting inner product scaled by a will always be non-negative. We need this because otherwise this distribution won't look like a bell. It could deviate in some direction upwards and then we can't normalize it to one because it grows without bound. So this is a hard requirement on the covariance that it has this proper algebraic structure. Once we have that, though, everything becomes super efficient. Because what we're left with is, if you leave out all the business with the exponentials up here, a quadratic function. And quadratic functions are some of the most regular objects known to humanity. Um, for example, the sum of two quadratic functions, if you think of a polynomial, right, a 0 plus a1 times x plus a2 times x squared, and another one, b0 plus b1 times x plus b2 times x squared, the sum of those two is another quadratic function, right? So what does this correspond to do the sum here? Well, it's in the exponential, so we have to multiply with each other. The product of two of these functions will be another one of these functions. That's what we use in conjugate prior inference. And it also means that if you have two Gaussian terms about a random variable, you can multiply them with, it, with each other, and out comes another Gaussian. So if you have one piece of knowledge about x that looks like this red Gaussian distribution, and another piece of knowledge that looks like this blue Gaussian distribution, then their product, which is what we do in Bayesian inference, is another Gaussian distribution which has a bunch of parameters which we need to compute. And now that we know that this is an exponential family, we actually know what those parameters are. The new precision is the sum of the precisions. So the new covariance is the inverse of the sum of the precisions. The new precision adjusted mean is the sum of the precision adjusted mean. So the new mean is the inverse of the new precision times the sum over the precision adjusted means. That's it. And of course, we have to do that in code, and we'll talk about that on Thursday. But we need to do it. Very, very important note, this is not the same as the distribution of the product of two Gaussian random variables. 
What I've done here is I've multiplied two Gaussian probability density functions. So that's one distribution over one variable called x about which we have two pieces of information. You can think for yourself about what happens if you would like to know the distribution over the product of x1 and x2 if they are both Gaussian distributed. And spoiler alert, that object is not a Gaussian random variable. It's not going to be super important for the rest of this class, but it's a co very, very common misconception, which I keep noting in, ex in exams. The other really cool thing about a quadratic function, which is not so easy to see in this, is not because it doesn't exist in the, well, actually, it exists in the univariate case as well. So if you have a polynomial, a0 times 1 plus a1 times x plus a2 times x squared, and so a0 plus a1 x plus b2 x, and you rewrite x in a linear form. So you write u is constant times x. Then this function, as a function of u, is still a quadratic function. Right? So there'll be a a0 plus a1 times u, uh, sorry, a1 times u over c, plus b2 times u squared over c squared. Right? So in a, as a function of u, that's still a quadratic function. More generally, in linear algebra terms, any linear projection of a Gaussian random variable is again a Gaussian random variable. So if z is Gaussian distributed with a mean and a covariance, then any linear map of z, a times z, will also be Gaussian distributed. So here is a Gaussian distribution in red. And what I've done is I've projected this distribution down along these dashed lines. That's a linear projection because the dashed lines are straight lines. If you take this entire blue cloud and you sum it up along those dashed lines, out comes another Gaussian distribution. Up to normalization, but the normalization is easy to compute because it's a Gaussian, so the integral is closed form. And this new distribution has a mean that is the linear map of the mean, and the covariance that is a linear, a bilinear map from both directions onto the covariance. A special case of this is marginals. In particular, I could project the entire distribution onto one of the axes. Right? So now the dashed lines are axis aligned. And that means that the map I'm choosing, A, is a sparse, is sort, of a, sort of a unit vector type matrix. So it has, in, in general, well, in, in, the, in this simple case, it has one, one, and everything else is zero. But it can also be a block matrix with a unit matrix and everything else is zero. And what that then means, if you look at this expression up here, is that we are selecting elements of mean and covariance. So if you have a bunch of Gaussian random variables, many of them, 5, 10, 50, a billion, 200 trillion, right? And you only care about one of them, or maybe you only care about five of them, then the corresponding marginal distribution is given by a Gaussian distribution, which you can very simply evaluate. You just pick out the elements of the mean of this big distribution that correspond to your variables you care about, and you pick out the submatrix, the block diagonal part of this huge covariance matrix. And obviously, looking up that subpart of this big array is easy. This means that we can keep track of a very, very, very large set, indeed, of random variables if they are jointly Gaussian distributed, as long as all the things we care about are linear maps of them. And it'll turn out in three or four lectures we can even keep track of an uncountably infinite set of random variables. It's a wonderful property of Gaussians because it means we can do this, 
It's also a bit of a dangerous property of Gaussians because it means if you have this really, really complicated set of objects you want to keep track of and you only talk about a subset of them, it's like completely ignoring the rest. You just forget about it by picking out the part. The other wonderful thing about quadratic functions, because that's what Gaussians are, exponentials of quadratics, is that if you take, and this is really not so entirely obvious in the univariate case, if you take one of these quadratic functions and you cut linearly through it at any angle, then the function evaluated along that cut is also a quadratic function. This is what you do when you complete the square in a quadratic completion problem. That's exactly what a cut is to this thing. So if I take this red curve and I cut along this, sorry, along this black line. So what we've previously done is we've projected onto the orthogonal of it, right? We take the entire cloud and we project it down. But I could also evaluate the function along the line and ignore everything around it. Then I also get a Gaussian distribution out. And of course, cutting through a distribution has an interpretation in probability language. It's called conditioning, exactly. Right? I had this picture in lecture three on continuous variables with this cloud where we can project to get the marginal or cut through to get the conditional. Conditioning amounts to computing this object, which we will talk about a lot over the next few lectures. So I'm not going to talk about it right now, but actually on the next slide, when we combine them together. Um, and the first thing you have to observe is, so computing this conditional distribution, which is saying, what is the distribution of x if x is a linear map of some, uh, uh, sorry, has been observed as some linear map of um, some other Gaussian random variable, then um, the conditional is a Gaussian distribution. So Gaussian distributions have two parameters, a mean and a covariance. So there they are. There's a distribution over x with a mean and a covariance. And the first observation we make is there is the data in here, y, the sort of the, the observed variable that we are conditioning on, and it shows up linearly in this expression. And then there are parameters of the distribution and the projection A that show up, and they don't all show up linearly, but the expressions in here are all linear algebra type expressions. So we compute A times sigma times A transpose. So in your head, you already have your NumPy code, right? It's A at sigma at A dot T. These are these basic operations. And then there's this inverse, and we'll, we'll need to talk about this inverse a lot because that's the part that is expensive. But it's the inverse of a matrix. So we know that computers somehow can compute inverses of matrices. They do that. It's not entirely straightforward, so we'll need to talk about it, but they can do it. And maybe the final thing to note is that the expressions in the mean and in the covariance, they seem to mirror themselves somehow, each other. There's that a lot of the stuff that's in here shows up in here as well. It's not quite the same thing. Uh, there are similar objects showing up. So maybe a first a gut feeling for this is if you think of the mean as a point estimate and the covariance as an error bar, a square error bar, then computing the square error bar will not actually involve much more than you need to compute the mean. Ooh, OK. So here's our big philosophical point again, right? Is Bayesian inference expensive? Well, not if it's Gaussian. Because if you can, the stuff you need to do to get the point estimate is pretty much everything you need to do to get the error estimate. Seems somehow weird, but it's actually true. So this object, and we will talk about this many, many, many times. I will make big arguments about it. This object, I said that the inverse of the matrix is usually the stuff that is complicated. Notice that this matrix inverse shows up both in the mean and the covariance. So the error estimate involves a quantity that we've already computed if we compute the mean. So if you are careful with our code construction, computing the error bar is not going to be more expensive in general than the mean. So that means if everything is Gaussian distributed, 
and the relationships between variables are linear, then we can do marginalization and we can do conditioning. What else do we need to do probabilistic inference other than marginalization and conditioning? Bayes' rule. But what is Bayes' rule? It's just the application of marginalization and conditioning. Right? It's a theorem. It's not an axiom. So we're done. If you have, cover if you have mar marginalization and conditioning, then we can do Bayesian inference just with linear algebra. So I think reveal didn't work. If you have one variable, x, that is Gaussian distributed, so it has, there's an associated distribution that has a mean and a covariance, and then you observe through a likelihood some data called y, which is also Gaussian distributed, where its relationship to the unknown quantity x enters in the mean of the Gaussian through a linear function. Sounds like a complicated stuff, right? And maybe it is. So if the likelihood has in particular this form, and this is actually the business part, because as we just realized in the first half of this lecture, this first part is kind of forced upon us by the structure. That's just the conjugate prior to this, this observation. Then the marginal over y, so the normalization constant in Bayes' theorem, is a number that can be evaluated by evaluating a Gaussian PDF or log PDF for the log evidence. And more importantly, the posterior distribution, the result of Bayes' theorem, is a Gaussian distribution which has parameters, mean and covariance, which can be computed through linear algebra. So at the moment, I will leave this red thing here just standing there as it is, and we will talk about it on Thursday a lot. But the main thing to take away from this complicated expression is that this computation involves NumPy code, not torch code, right? Not scipy.optimize or Atom or whatever. It just involves A at sigma A transpose, then a matrix inverse, solve, linear algebra stuff, the sort of stuff that's available in a package without fancy numerical optimization. And the terms in the mean and the covariance are related to each other. They contain terms that you've already computed. Um, yeah, so, okay, teaser. I will talk about this on Thursday again. All of these are really very, very fundamental mathematical aspects of linear algebra, really, rather than Gaussian distributions. They are related to a fundamental a result of actually group theory that is often expressed in terms of linear algebra, but it's even more general than linear algebra, which is connected to many, many different names. So depending on how you write the equation and what you talk about, there are people like Sherman and Morrison and Woodbury talk of. But actually, the most interesting person maybe to talk about historically is this guy here called Isai Shur. He has one of these very late 19th century, early 20th century um, uh, lives very, in many ways, well, early on, I think, right, happy, but then also later on, really complicated life. As you can maybe guess from the name, he was Jewish. He was born in what is now Belarus um, and emigrated to, well, moved to, to start with his family to what is now called, I think, Lithuania. And then he moved to Berlin to study mathematics. He became the successor to Felix Klein, in, um, in Göttingen, maybe the most eminent German mathematician at the time. And uh, sh he was always trying to get a position in, in, uh, in Berlin. He became a member of the Leopoldina and various other uh, high-ranking German organizations. And then the Nazis came in, and he had to stop teaching in 1939 and emigrate to first Switzerland and then Palestine, um, where he died in 1941 of a heart attack. He worked on all sorts of aspects of group theory, and in particular, he left us as part of a proof, actually as a margin note for a ma major theorem that he provided called Schuer's Lemma, with a representation of how you can think about structured terms in the inverse of a matrix. So when you have a matrix and you're computing its inverse, which, as you saw, we need to do for Gaussian distributions all the time, a lot of very structured objects turn up, show, show up that have really beautiful interpretations. They are actions of 
um, parts of the group on some other parts that are in some sense irreducible, and they um, in particular involve this object M, which is called the sure complement these days, and they tell us something about what the numbers in these matrices in Gaussian distributions actually mean. There is no time to do it now, but um, we'll make, maybe do it on Thursday again, but basically, thanks to results like this, first of all, you can speed up the computations, but also we can look at the numbers in the matrices and they tell us something interpretable about the variables, about their marginal and conditional independence. So the directed graphical model that we observed in the second lecture turns into a matrix with zeros and non-zeros in the Gaussian case. And if you've studied theoretical computer science, you know that it's a beautiful situation when you can replace a graph with a matrix because then you can study the matrix, which is much easier to study. So Gaussian distributions translate, that's the final thing I want to say, sort of, for a few minutes, they translate this complicated business of probabilistic inference, all these fancy mathematical statements about keeping track of measures and sigma algebras and these abstract objects that are functions being multiplied with each other, they translate all of this into linear algebra. Products of Gaussian probability density functions are Gaussian probability density functions. Linear projections of Gaussian probability density, of Gaussian random variables are Gaussian random variables. Conditionals of joint Gaussian random variables as long as the conditional is linear, are Gaussian random variables. And that means that all of Bayesian, Bayesian inference turns into linear algebra when we use Gaussians and linear relationships between them. In the most general case, they turn into this very complicated expression that takes the entire breadth of the slide. And we will stare at them for a while over the next few weeks to figure out what's going on there. But the main thing is that if you have a Gaussian prior over a variable and observations that are linearly Gaussian related to that variable, or actually affine Gaussian related, as a slight generalization of a linear, then the posterior distribution will be Gaussian and the parameters of that Gaussian will be linear algebra expressions of the parameters of prior and likelihood. And in fact, any linear map of that posterior random variable will also be Gaussian distributed like this. And because computers are good with linear algebra, and because autodiff is about linear algebra, Gaussians are everywhere. And Gaussians will be, to probabilistic machine learning, what autodiff is to deep learning. They are the fundamental object we want to work with. So over the course of this class, we will build up a toolbox for building machine learning algorithms with a probabilistic perspective, which I will add more and more to. You've already encountered the fundamental framework, marginalization, conditioning, and Bayesian, Bayesian inference. And we encountered a bunch of structures that help us along the way, both for modeling and for computation. I will talk more and more about these with this lecture, we have ended our look at exponential families as the algebraic structures that translate potentially intractable Bayesian inference onto tractable Bayesian inference, period. And now we're entering Gaussians as a special case of exponential families, which map not just to tractable inference, but to linear algebra tractable inference. And we've already seen today, right in the middle between the two parts of the lecture, that the Laplace approximation is one way to match those two to each other. You take any exponential family, and then with some caveats about the domain of the parameters, if you can compute curvatures and the mode, then you can map from an exponential family to a Gaussian distribution. So with that, I'm at the end for today. Please leave some feedback. From Thursday onwards, we will talk much more hands-on about Gaussian distributions, and you'll see some more streamlit apps again and actual pictures and code. Thank you.